I am going to just talk through my, uh, my essay, which I hope some of you have gotten a chance to look through. Um, and I'm going to, it, it's fairly dense, so I, I don't actually cover everything that's in the essay, but I'm going to cover the two things that I think are most interesting, new, relevant, uh, of, uh, of, of note. So I, I, work, I take two starting assumptions. So the first assumption is that we're working within the uh, ramsey cass Coopins framework. Uh, that's a, an assumption. I don't argue for it. Uh, I think there are good reasons to adopt this as a framework, um, not least uh, as a coordination problem type response. Uh, and if you wanted reasons to defend this kind of framework, I would point you to Partha's three, uh, three conceptions of intergenerational justice, in which he does some of this work. But for my purposes, that's an assumption. The other really important assumption is that the assignments of values to the parameters uh, delta and eta are normative judgments. Um, and that, again, is an assumption. Uh, there are things I could say to defend it, uh, but I'm going to make that assumption. I think uh, probably a lot of the people in this room will be sympathetic to that view. Um, and now we actually have some uh, data from Moritz which suggests that uh, uh, economists uh, tend towards that view as opposed to the positive side as well. So there is. Any, anyway, a tendency towards that side. So I think it's reasonable to accept that. And the reason I take both of these assumptions is to uh, reduce the discussion space to a manageable size. And then what I want to talk about is the kinds of ways we might go about making these va uh, value judgments, ways we might assign values to these parameters. That's a fairly pragmatic methodological question. Um, on the assumption that we are in a, in a state of normative uncertainty, that we don't know what the values are, that we don't know uh, true values for these, um, which makes, of course, the question non-trivial and interesting. Um, and I also think possibly represents our much the actual situation. OK, so in the paper, I talk about three sort of families of methodologies that we could use. And uh, the first one I'm going to say is, uh, uh, we'll call it philosophical argumentation. So when I talk to uh, moral philosophers who are not climate ethicists, or political philosophers who are not climate ethicists, and I sort of discuss, I discuss the kinds of uh, issues that I'm interested in, and they say, oh, that, that sounds interesting. And then they uh, say, so, so what do you do about that? And I say, uh, well, um, okay. maybe you'd agree it sounds like a normative question and they say yeah and I say well what, what do you do when you are confronted with normative questions and they say ah you can do what we normally do as philosophers you can uh, adduce reasons and give arguments and here I mean in a broad sense arguments that are abductive inductive <coughs> and deductive um, now I'm going to suggest that that is a really that's not a very helpful methodology in this context. And I'm going to give uh, something stronger. In the paper, I give uh, an argument about why this is not going to be helpful. So I, I should be really clear about what my claim is. My claim is that arguments with conclusions that are for particular values of these parameters, philosophical argumentation is not going to be relevant. So here are the uh, assumptions that I need to make this go through. And I actually think I can relax some of these assumptions I make strong assumptions, and I'll maybe mention quickly why I think I could relax them. But the first assumption is that the conclusion is uh, actually normative. And in, the, in this context, uh, as a very rough and ready uh, view of normativity, I know normativity is extremely complicated. This is a very rough view. Uh, a normative judgment is not uh, determined by anything that is purely empirically, a purely empirical phenomenon. So the idea here is that uh, normativity has some sort of independence. It can be sort of fed into by empirical. There are empirical things can be relevant, perhaps, but they're not sufficient to get uh, true normative judgments. Uh, so that's, that's the view on normativity. There's, there's lots of potential worries about it, but I'm, I'm going to uh, put that aside, and I'm happy to be pushed on it. Um, so let's suppose that the conclusion, the conclusions that we're looking for are Legit, are normative in this sense. So they're judgments of the form, things like uh, delta equals 
0.5 or 80 equals 1.7. That's a kind of substantive normative claim I'm interested in. Um, now, if it's normative in the sense I've said, then the premises that you use to support it uh, cannot come from purely empirical sources because those are not sufficient to establish the truth of that sort of claim. But there's, I, I suggest that there's not going to be non-empirical uh, sources that are going to get you to particular values. Um, so the claim is that in general, uh, in these kinds of questions, you are not going to be able to use philosophical argumentations to directly argue for particular values of these kinds of parameters. Now, what, what kinds of domains am I talking about? Uh, the first important consideration is that these domains have to be continuous in the uh, very similar to the sense of continuum that we've talked a lot about today. Uh, and uh, that, that you can place any point, if you have uh, two points, that there exists a point between them that makes it continuous. Um, and that we're not talking about extreme values or critical values, uh, maxima and minima. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I think you can use philosophical argumentation when you're talking about extreme values. So I think, for example, you can use philosophical argument when you're talking about delta equals zero, assuming that's a minimum which I think uh, we usually have that assumption. Um, then uh, these extreme values you can, you can look at reasons for, but there's not going to be, I suggest, philosophical argumentation that allows you to argue for something like uh, eta 1.5 as opposed to eta equals 2. I don't think philosophical argumentation is going to uh, do that because the domain is continuous and neither of those values are critical or extreme values. Okay, uh, there are ways I think you can uh, relax those conditions, but uh, that's, that's the claim I make in the paper. Uh, the other really important thing I say, so then I, I talk about uh, reasons that we can't, I, I think it's not sensible to appeal to social judgments uh, in this context, and uh, the main thing here that's relevant is that if we're assuming it's truly normative, then those are not the right kinds of uh, the right kinds of judgments to instantiate or, or justify uh, particular values, but that's less important. So the more, more substantive thing I say, uh, and which, relate, which relates to the topic of expertise in this context, is uh, that in this situation where we're in this, uh, this kind of normative uncertainty, I suggest there is something of normative value in appealing to experts. So here's why. So first of all, I have to explain what I mean by an expert in this context. Um, in the literature, uh, there's a distinction between ethical expertise and moral expertise. Moral experts know the substantive moral truths. Um, ethical experts do not know the substantive normative truths, but they, uh, sort of substantive normative or moral truths, but they know the relevant empirical information and or the possible theories that could be applied and their implications for the possible situation without knowing which one is the correct one to apply, for example. Um, so the kind of expertise I'm interested in here is ethical expertise. And the kind of ethical expertise that's relevant in this context are people, uh, experts would be people who know theoretical or practical, but primarily theoretical consequences of adopting particular values of the normative parameters delta and eta. So, for example, uh, a really good example is, is uh, Dasgupta talking about ways that if we put in particular values, we can run classroom models and see what the implications are for some sort of basic macroeconomic variables. This will tell us, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a way of being expert because you're showing that there are certain consequences. You know how different uh, assignments of these variables have implications for other parts of the framework. And presumably that information is not available to uh, the regular people, not experts. So that's that's uh, uh, so these kinds of sort of uh, we might call it conditional judgments are the things that are relevant, uh, are are ethically expert in this context. Okay, so why is that helpful here? Well, I want to suggest that, uh, and this is the provocative claim, uh, that if it's normatively valuable that social plans are coherent and generally consistent, then we should have more feeding in by experts because experts are aware of the social and theoretical consequences of adopting particular values. And then uh, how would we actually use this methodologically? 
Well, the obvious way is some sort of expert elicitation project, uh, say a survey, referendum, that sort of thing. And um, what is so exciting uh, for me um, as a philosopher uh, after thinking about this as a potential methodology that I think helps us. So it, to be clear, it's not because they know the moral truth. They're not moral experts. It's because they know they can give more coherent, complete social plans. And that, I suggest, is at least a necessary condition on good social plans, not a sufficient condition, obviously. Um, but the idea is that if this is uh, valuable in terms of a way to try to uh, deal with this situation um, in this framework, with working within this framework, uh, then it makes sense to ask different experts, people who are aware of the social and theoretical consequences of particular values, to uh, state those on the record, as it were. And um, what's so exciting is that, is that Moritz et al. Uh, have done this. And so I remember reading, uh, well, actually, I'll, 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 say, I'll, save, I'll save that for my comment on Moritz. But, I think that it's uh, that's that's really exciting to me. So I'm interested in questions on either of those on this argument uh, against philosophical arg argumentation and uh, this other one about uh, the potential use of experts in um, elicitation in determining these values in the comments or aspects of the paper if you the paper which presented. I really appreciate it. All right, oh, thanks. <laughs>